Shelby, would you like to kick off with your introduction then, please? Thank you. Of course. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Shelby Judge. I'm an early career academic at the University of Derby, researching digital activist and literary feminist responses to incels and the manosphere. Um, previous to that, I completed my PhD at the University of Glasgow, where I was researching contemporary feminist adaptations of Greek myth. Um, so a bit of a shift, but yeah. So uh, I suppose today um, I'm here sort of as the voice of the early careers. Um, I'm honestly hoping to learn a lot uh, and sort of share my experiences as someone who is just starting out in a sense, um, but also has, you know, some experience of publishing as a PhD and ECR. That's great. Thanks a lot, Shelby. Kate? Yeah, hi there. So I'm Kate O'Neill. I'm the Scholarly Licensing Manager at the University of Sheffield Library. So I'm responsible for um, supporting copyright and licensing. Um, I have worked in open research in libraries for it's around 10 years now, particularly around open access. And um, recently have been involved heavily in our institution's adoption of rights retention policy. And um, I've also done a lot with green open access, gold open access, diamond open access. Um, and I might possibly be the voice of the slightly jaded librarian on the panel. Um, and, and I really hope that, you know, we can have a great discussion that reinvigorates everyone as we, we move towards a better open access future. Thank you, Kate. Caroline. Morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Caroline Edwards. I'm a senior lecturer in contemporary literature and culture at Birkbeck University of London. I'm possibly the slightly jaded voice of the mid career, early to mid career academic. Um, I've been an academic now for 13 years, um, but I've also worked a lot in open access. So for the last 10 years, I've been working in open access publishing and advocacy. I run the Diamond Open Access Publisher, Open Library of Humanities. Um, and we publish around 30 uh, peer reviewed journals across the humanities and social sciences. Wonderful. Thank you, Caroline. And Stephen. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. I am very definitely the uh, jaded uh, senior researcher in the room. Um, uh, I'm a professor of computational neuroscience. I look at how the, the brain develops and I try and use theoretical approaches to, to study that. But for the point of today's uh, discussion, I've had a long-standing interest in open access uh, as, as the general theme of open research for the last 20 plus years. It's great to see actually things improving. So although we're all jaded, things are hopefully getting better. And I, I look forward to today. I don't know whether I should be concerned about that. <laughs> about that. But like you say, Kate, hopefully some of today's discussion will reinvigorate those of us that may be feeling a little bit um a little bit jaded. Um so I guess sort of really to kick things off, um, a question to all of you um sort of on the panel. What are your experiences so rather than what have you done what are your experiences of publishing open access or supporting open access um publishing um perhaps um Stephen if we could start with you then as our sort of long-standing academic you're sort of you know how how was the experience for you sort of publishing open access so I I was thinking about this uh, over the weekend and I think there's a it's very heavily field dependent, I think. And I, got, I, I think I've been quite lucky. I've worked in very theoretical fields. Um, we have benefited from having the archive, for example, that uh, has really helped push full prints, which still isn't taken for granted in a lot of fields. Whereas in the sort of mathematical and theoretical disciplines, I think preprints have really sort of helped make open access an easier sell compared to other fields. So I would say overall things have been fairly smooth, but I've had lots of bumps along the way. Um, I I was one of the few people that used the Spark uh, addendum to try and get papers published open access. Once it went through great, once it was a big fight. Um, and in the end, the publisher, um, beginning with N, ending in E, and based in London, um, relented and uh, uh, decided just to make the paper open access, but didn't agree to the, the addendum. So it, it's all a bit of a mess. 
Um, and I think the reason it's a mess is because uh, it's all very disjointed and we, we need a much more joined up approach. But maybe uh, I'll say more about that later. Thank you. Thank you. And that's really interesting to sort of um, that you sort of mentioned around preprints and sort of the ability of preprints to enable open access. And hopefully that's something that we can sort of come on to and sort of discuss in a little bit more um, detail sort of, um, you know, throughout the session. OK, um, Caroline. Um, yeah, so your experience with publishing open access, has it been hideous, hence starting, you know, <laughs> being involved with the Open Library of Humanities? Or, yeah, if you could just tell us a little about, about your experiences. Yeah, sure. I'll start with a recent experience in the last uh, three months as an author, which was very positive, but very unequal. So I submitted um, an article to a journal that had been um, kind of invited for a special issue. And it went through the peer review process. And then at the end of the peer review process, when journals would ordinarily send out what authors tend to think is a kind of copyright agreement, it's actually a copyright transfer agreement, which means that I sign away my rights to my own work and I gift it to the publisher. Um, and there's a there's a whole package of discussions and issues around rights retention that we might come on to in a minute. But at that moment, it asked whether I wanted to publish open access. And I said, yes, please. And as it happens, the journal I was publishing with is um, their publisher had been bought out by the um, Taylor and Francis um, sort of large group. And these are one of the large commercial publishers who have what are known now as transformative agreements in the UK with UK libraries. And what that means is my library has paid a large sum of money on an annual basis for the moment, as long as these agreements hold, um, for, for scholars at Birkbeck like myself to just be able to publish at open access. So at that point, it was incredibly easy. I just kind of ticked the box. It all went through the platform. And the article came out open access. Now, in that special issue that I was in with about six other colleagues, I think mine was the only open access article. And so within a couple of months, it's already got sort of 800 views and lots of people sharing it and things like that. Um, one of my former PhD students who has now, uh, she's now an early career researcher, she's an independent scholar, she's obviously looking for work at the moment and the job market is very difficult. Um, published at the same time as me and obviously had no recourse to that kind of agreement or that kind of institutional support. And so although my experience was great, that's only because my library is paying a huge amount of money. But for somebody who doesn't have um, institutional affiliation, their article wasn't able to be published open access. So I really wanted to highlight the kind of inequalities that are that are working at the moment. Um, I can come back and say more about the Open Library of Humanities from the publisher perspective, perhaps in a bit, if you like. No, that would be great. And yeah, it sort of echoes what you were saying, Stephen, about sort of the inconsistency sort of a, of approach across sort of across the board, really. Um, but let's hear from um, Kate, um, sort of your experiences, and then perhaps we can come back and reflect on some of the points that have been raised thus far. Yeah, I think it's it, obviously it chimes very much what Stephen and Caroline have just said, because in in the time that I've been doing this, we've had academics who everything has flowed through so smoothly. It's been wonderful. You know, they, they've kind of gone, my word, how, how amazing is this? And then we've also had people having to fight every step of the way to make something open access and sometimes not achieving what they want. Um, so I think really my, my sort of my overarching experience of this is that Whilst things have improved from the academic perspective because of the transformative agreements Caroline mentioned, A, the fact they're not accessible to everyone means great for our academics, not for other people. Um, there is still an awful lot of us having to say it depends. If you're funded, then this. If you're not funded, then that. When was it accepted? So which policy does it fall under? And I I think the, the big difference that I'm noticing is that our academics do seem to be moving away when they're talking about publishing open access. Yes, there's the whole I need to be compliant, but there is from a, a small but growing number, a real sort of wanting to understand a little bit more about the mechanisms as to is this the best way to go in terms of ethical sort of publishing. 
Um, and that's that is heartening to see. But yes, over the year, basically, it's been whatever you can imagine, absolute horror stories, absolutely brilliant. Um, but we're still dealing very much academic by academic. And that's fine. But it would be good maybe if some of the publishers actually worked with us a little bit more to provide a, a better experience, I think. That's great. Thank you very much, Kate. And yeah, sort of that that whole question around sort of ethical um, publishing and actually researchers wanting to know if, um, you know, sort of it is kind of ethical, if it is the right way to go, is very interesting. And again, perhaps something that we can pick up in reference to the Open Library of Humanities um, and sort of other experiences later on. Shelby, a little bit from you, perhaps, about your experiences thus far. Yeah, so I think... Um... When, so I published an article in like my first year of my PhD and I think I got a completely unusual experience. So I published with quite a small one star journal and it was just open access as standard. Like when, when it came out, it just went on the website, the university website and um, that it was affiliated to. And there was no no question about it. And um and I have had some experience quite early on with like peer reviewing and editing and things like this with journals. And again, they were the smaller journals where everything was just open at the point of publication. Um, and then more recently, the articles that I've published, one of them um, has like a two year embargo on it. And the other one is green open access. Um, and really, I only learned the importance of um open access and the significance of it i'm only i'm still learning about it now but i only really learned started learning about it post phd because previous to that during the phd and during like the academic job market um it's just it's just publications like you've just got to get them out there and it, they they don't stress the importance of where they are or um the who gets access to them and then it was only through um during the beginning of my uh current position where I had training with the lovely Emma and Holly where we we started talking about this and the importance of um, open access and it was something that hadn't been stressed when I was on the academic job market and they were like you just have to have publications out there so I think it's something that I've sort of come to quite gradually. That's great that's um, you know that's really sort of well, thank you for your comments about sort of you know training from the library at Derby. Is this something that perhaps other panelists have experienced in terms of sort of um, you know publishing open access support offered for perhaps early career researchers, early career academics? Is it something that sort of you've come across sort of perhaps the inconsistency in support and or awareness? Uh, perhaps um, Stephen, sort of come to you. Um, so yes, I think it's very patchy, actually. Um, we're very lucky, I think, at Cambridge that the uh, the university library team are so proactive and so visible. But I've been in other institutions where it's it's not not been as visible. So it really does depend on having good souls and contacts in 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 the institution. Um, but I, I think it's part of the culture that, you know, it's not just, you know, it's it's very easy for me to say, well, those people in the library should be doing more. It's also that, you know, the academics should be explaining more within their research groups and leading by example. Um, so I hope that I've done right by the students that I've, I've mentored. But again, I look around and I think that is very patchy. So it's not just up to librarians to provide that support it's all it's about the research culture generally to try and make sure that people understand the implications of where they're publishing like caroline you were nodding in agreement with a lot of those yeah. points would you like to sort of you know talk through sort of some of yeah some of your perspectives on this Yes, I completely agree about the research culture needing to change and, and librarians have really been leading the way on campaigning for open access for such a long time. And I often feel quite ashamed as an academic that we don't do more to support our librarians who are trying really hard with limited budgets. Um, one thing I was going to kind of draw out was the the differences, I guess, between the sort of top down imposition of research evaluation criteria and policies 
versus the kind of bottom up academic culture. So when we launched the Open Library of Humanities in 2013, at that time, um, open access was being investigated by the British government um, and there was um, a report by Dame Janet Finch looking into the benefits of open access and so we entered into quite a hostile atmosphere I would say where myself and my colleague Martin Eve who's a well-known open access campaigner were going around to colleagues departments and being invited to speak at various um, academic events and workshops and things and although people knew us and liked us and were friends and colleagues with us they were very hostile to open access generally because there was a widespread perception at that time that this was just another thing that was kind of being dumped on academics like we have to adapt to all of our virtual learning environments we have to take our own registers we have to do pastoral care you know we've eroded academic job security over the you know the past 15 or so years academics workloads have gone through the roof it was just another thing that they had to try and understand and to be fair keeping up with open access policy is very difficult it's a very even now it's still a very fast changing environment um the policy mandates are different in every country they're different with every research funder um it, it's very difficult it's very technical and detailed you need to kind of understand quite a lot of the technical infrastructure because of the patchiness that emma and, and stephen have mentioned so we were trying our, our main job at OLH in the early days and, and still to this day, I would argue, was to try and tackle that perception that this is just something that's being done to us. And if we don't do this, our research publications won't be REF compliant. And now, of course, those open access um, mandates have gone further. And so now for a journal article, if you don't make it open within three months of acceptance article acceptance whether that's by a green self-archiving route with your university institutional repository or whether you know there's some other uh, well whether it's diamond open access published or a transformative agreement or whatever gold open access i guess um then then your research won't be eligible to be submitted on behalf of your department so we've worked incredibly hard to think about the bottom up side of the equation how can we actually encourage academics to take advantage of something that is manifestly in the public good you know your research will have higher visibility it will have higher impact we have an, we have a huge number of statistics and article download stats to prove that this is the case it will be available to people all over the world it will reach communities way beyond the university and the ivory tower if you're working in you know stem sciences or biomedical sciences it will reach charity medical charities who don't have access to journals because they don't have library subscriptions necessarily and they may even be the very bodies that funded some of that research um, so there are just so many reasons if we think about inequity at the global level the inequities between the global north and the global south in scholarship is something we're really aware oh, of so when we've published um we've worked with colleagues in india for example doing uh, a couple of fantastic special collections on um game studies uh, scholars who work in digital media um and they've all said you know we don't have access to any of the articles that we need to teach our students so i, I mean i could go on and on and on on the benefits but i i do think this culture is possibly shifting and there are definitely hopeful signs but there's still a really long way to go and i'm very conscious that my academic colleagues sort of feel under attack all the time because workloads are so difficult you know university employment conditions are so difficult so it's a very it's a very tricky landscape to navigate I would say. Yeah definitely and that's certainly something sort of as a library team that we are noticing sort of the change in you know, I think there's sort of that perception that, you know, academics, you know, they, they work when they want, they don't have to do this, they wander in, you know, they don't have to work for the whole of the summer. And, you know, there's that perception. And certainly sort of as a library team, we are noticing sort of some of the some of the pressures um, that are changing, that are emerging on, you know, some of our academic colleagues. And perhaps if there's any academics sort of here today, you know, it would be great to hear from you either in the chat or in the Q&A about how um, 
you feel sort of you know perhaps a library could support you better or organizations such as the open library of humanities could support you better to gain that sort of understanding about you know sort of open access as well but kate coming to you and sort of picking up on some of the points that caroline mentioned around sort of a sustainable sort of ethical way of publishing and this is something that that you mentioned as well and that your researchers are sort of asking you more about could you perhaps expand a little bit more on that um side of things um, from the yeah. Sheffield experience, please. Yeah, sure, I think I think Caroline's point about how sort of you know the the bureaucracy of you know coming along telling people they have to do this for ref purposes, blah blah blah, when people are already overworked, um, has been difficult over the years. And so, obviously, what we've done in the background is simplify everything as much as possible so that it is the easiest thing in the world to make your work open access via whichever route you're choosing. Um, so we're not perfectly there yet, but it's a lot a lot smoother than it used to be. So therefore, what we're actually able to do is, because people don't have to worry about the mechanisms, it means that when we do have these opportunities for advocacy, we can actually talk more widely about what the issues are. Because obviously one of the things about making it smoother is that you are actually shielding the academics from things such as costing and price of going. If there's a transformative agreement, you don't actually know how much that article costs. You just click a button. It's magic. It happens. When you put something in the repository, well, that's just great. It just becomes available. And you're going, we've got a highly skilled team there. Um, you know, Claire, Tom, Amy and Holly, who are amazing. Going and they are the ones who are doing this, and and it's not free. And I think this is it. You know, we, I, I keep having to to talk about this of saying, you know, the repository isn't free. The the servers, the infrastructure, the staffing, um, looking into uh, long term digital preservation. These have costs. And again, when someone says, "My God," yeah, you see it on Twitter. They, "My God, I got to publish my article for free with Taylor and Francis. Thanks, library." No, no, no it's not free. There was no cost to you. So. But because we we have these ways of doing things much more simply, it actually gives us more time to be able to explore um, the the politics of publishing, the economics of it, um, the power structures within it. And yes, it might have to be light touch from a library perspective because we don't have the time. This is a, we we have the time. We could make the time. Academics don't have the time to sit and, and listen and welcome me for for an hour long debate on this um so being able to go in and just highlight these things to have people take it away muse over it and that's how that's when people do get back to us saying actually i was really interested in what you said so and then the questions about um what they can do and it is interesting again as stephen pointed out the people who are actually um quite senior within these research communities trying to model best practice of saying actually yes we do want to be be more equitable and so again i can bang on all i like but if the person in charge of your lab is saying no you're publishing in nature behind a paywall it doesn't really matter what i say so yeah yeah i, I think that's it. it it's being able to streamline things makes it easier which is both good and bad good that it gives us time to discuss things better bad in that we are shielding people from the reality of what's happening yeah do any of the panelists want to sort of come back on sort of that those sort of comment well not come back but <laughs> you know sort of expand on any of those comments from sort of their their point of view shelby any sort of thoughts about sort of um I guess sort of the awareness around what open access sort of actually actually means in terms of potentially cost and you know what could potentially be done um, to sort of streamline processes at all. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, we, we took like there's been a bit of discussion there about like bottom up but I think top down is also really important I think um conversations between the amazing library teams and the people in charge of the university who have the money and have the the power to control where their priorities are I think that those conversations need to be far more frequent as well because it seems to me that um a lot of the the 
buzzwords that higher up people in the university like to use, like um, research excellence and uh, impact and um, access and diversity and inclusion. A lot of these things can be um, are central to the open access topic. And it seems like there should be more of a thing like it seems like a really obvious thing when we're having this conversation that the university should want to do that. The the business behind the university should want to do that. And it seems strange that that's not always the case. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Shelby. And I think this, I'm gonna, <laughs> I can see Stephen smiling. I don't know if you're sort of thinking the same thing that I am, but it sort of leads me kind of to the point around sort of rights retention and retaining rights um, in order to ensure that maximum sort of impact. I don't know if you want to sort of, um, you know, talk a little bit about your work in that area, Stephen, and um, sort of around, um, you know, rights retention as potentially one way that we can achieve all these things that Shelby's just been talking about, you know, hopefully making it as easy as possible for the researchers and the authors in the process. Um, well, before getting to the serious point about rights retention, I was just going to comment that it sounds like Shelby has joined the uh, jaded club already. So I was um, a bit worried that I was meant to be the optimist of the group. Um, <laughs> it didn't seem like a good sign. It, it, I mean, you, you're so right to pick up on this. You know, there's a there's a lot of language that people seem to be jumping on and using. Um, and I think you just have to you know you just have to sort of tolerate what what you what you can and just get on you know just get on with your job which is sort of segueing now to rights retention i think we were incredibly lucky at cambridge to be talking about this as academics at the same time as people in the library were were um and i think that was just fortuitous and you know of course hats off to edinburgh for getting uh, getting it uh, getting it done uh, first and so Chris Banks for all her work over the years on this but for me rights retention I think has been a real eye-opener um, we say that you know that uh, you know some of us have been in this field for a very long time I mean I personally am still learning things because the landscape is changing so rapidly I know you know just as soon as you think you have understood this system it just gets more complicated and, and rights retention is just another example of that as Caroline mentioned, you know, the, these copyright transfer agreements are uh, effectively put in front of academics and we will sign anything. You know, we will just sign whatever it is to get the article published. Um, rights retention, I think, at an individual level as well as at an institutional level, starts to sort of redress the balance of it and allow us to actually think about really keeping hold of our, our copyright and to be aware starting to be aware of that actually impacts on everything it's not just in the context of publishing your article it's then in terms of your data reuse and when you when you want to share your data and so forth so i think it has the potential to be quite transformational to start people thinking about what's the licensing on this object be it a paper or be it a, uh, be it a bit of code or data that's come out of your research. I think this is this is really, really useful. So, you know, um, I got quite excited about rights retention and I think uh, I think it's great to see how it's flourishing in the UK. I'm ever mindful that publishers are probably one step ahead of us. Um, and I think we've seen that already with the American Chemical Society trying to uh, now pay for just processing the article um, if it mentions rights retention. So it's it's certainly useful from the institutional side, I think, to collect rights to our articles. Um, I hope that in three years time, this is just not not discussed. Right. It's just a standard part. It of happens. Yeah. Right. It's 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 just done. But then I don't think open access will be in a that won't be open access solved. Right. So we need to we need to keep we need to keep on our toes about this. Um, but I look forward to hear what other people have to say about rights retention. From yeah, I can see. <laughs> yeah, the, the point that, you know, Caroline nodding vigorously in terms of, um, you know, kind of what Stephen said. Have you got anything to add? In, yeah. <laughs> 
off you go. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, I, I'm very excited by a slightly different side of rights retention, which takes it to the next level, I guess, which is the, the, inter the intellectual property of the journal as, as an entire publication. So one of the things that we've been working really hard on at the Open Library of Humanities, and we've still got a huge amount of work, I think, to do to communicate this to, to people, is that although we may call ourselves a publisher, uh, albeit not for profit, scholar led and so on, we are challenging commercial publishers. We never own the IP of a journal. Um, and so this comes over to the question of journal flipping. And journal flipping is a term that's been used for some years to describe um, journals that were formerly published by a traditional quote unquote legacy publisher, often um, a commercial press rather than a university press, which tend not quite to be profit making in the same way, at least. And the editorial board uh, want to go open access. The, the publisher says, no, you can't. And actually, you don't own this journal. We own the title. Um, and so then what the journal editors are left um, with is that they have to actually quit. They have to leave en masse and set up a new title to replicate the old title. Mm -hmm. They have to somehow communicate that the entire community has moved with them, that there is effectively a brain drain that goes to the new community governed, community owned title. And what is left behind is what people sometimes call a zombie journal. <laughs> um, I'm actually wearing a zombie journal t-shirt today. We have a zombie journal campaign that I can share the link for um, to try and draw people's attention to this as, as a term in the open access vernacular that what happens is the old title is then, um, you know, stumbling on without its editors. The commercial publisher obviously replaces the editorial board, but the standards degrade very quickly on the ground. But actually, there's a time lag of about four or five years where because of the way that metrics, um, journal metrics work, so the impact factor and things like that, it takes four or five years for for that um degrading of quality to actually catch up and so a lot of people who don't know these stories don't necessarily know that this journal is no lo no longer has the trust and the value and the respect of its community the community have gone elsewhere um so i am really fascinated um working with our editorial teams on olh journals because you have you have a range of different kind of journals so some of them who are very long standing Perhaps they set up as a society journal in the 1940s or 1950s even, and they did own their title and they had some sort of legal documentation to prove that. And then because of because they've been going for so long, sometimes they may have moved publishers over the years. That happens. And then at some point they digitized maybe in the late 90s or early 2000s. And so they they own their journal title. And if they wish to migrate and become a full diamond open access journal, they are able to do that as soon as their contract expires. And they're usually, I don't know, two to five year agreements. You know, they are then ready to move and find another publisher. But for many journals, they were set up by the publisher in collaboration with the, the editors and the academics. If you want a really kind of scary example of, of what was going on, I mean, Robert Maxwell's publishing company, Pegasus, back in the 80s, he was going around the world to all of these science conventions. He was whining and dining editors and setting up journals, as many as he could, because they were very profitable because of the amount of kind of post-war academic um, and institutional funding that the American government had made available. So it was a business model. And then, um, you know, he, obviously his, him and his um, former publisher don't exist anymore, but many of those journals still do exist. So when I'm talking to um, academic editors, that sometimes they don't know, they actually don't know who owns their journal. They do, who owns the name, the branding, the logo? You know, is it the community? Is it the publisher? These things aren't even clear. And in cases where actually the community owns the journal because they set it up under a scholarly association, they ran it themselves, it, you know, nobody else owns it. They don't even have documentation to prove that they own it, which makes them vulnerable in the future years to come to a commercial publisher then coming in and acquiring them. So I'm working with my editors just to get that paperwork sorted out, just so that it's a 
it's clear. Um, and this varies from country to country. So, for example, colleagues who work in the Netherlands, so we work with linguistics um, journals who are legally based in the Netherlands. And I know that OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association, is also based in the Netherlands. The Netherlands have a very um, robust legal framework called Stichtung, um, and that's how they protect not-for-profit um, community organisations like cooperatives effectively but it's not the same in the UK and it's not the same in the US and so um, the question of rights retention has the power to be transformational Stephen's absolutely right but what if we took that to the next level and thought about entire journals and entire communities that's really interesting and you know yeah you can sort of see um, yeah, kind of going forwards, lots and lots of what you call these zombie journals, which admittedly is not a term that I was um, aware of. I don't know if anybody else sort of, you know, present here today has sort of come across this term or had experience of a public, um, a journal sort of migrating um, and, you know, sort of going to um, sort of another another publisher. I don't know if Stephen or Kate have sort of anything sort of to say in relation to sort of Caroline's points. There was something I did want to raise around university presses, but perhaps hear from Stephen and Kate um, initially, if there's anything that you wanted to add in terms of Caroline's points. I think I think Caroline has articulated that so much better than I could and far more comprehensively. Um, because so I when it comes to rights retention as as a policy, as a mechanism, I think it's useful. I don't think it's the be all, the end all. I don't think it's it's magical as a mechanism as it's currently being used by institutions. So to hear how Caroline's talking about it in this much wider sense of true ownership, of true community rights, because of course right now, yes, we're talking about institutional rights, but how they reply, apply to that individual. And really what we want to be thinking about is the collective rights of your community and your community can be so many different groupings of yes the place that you publish the people you publish with the people who read your work yes the people within your institution but the people within your field you know that there's so many ways that you can view community and so thinking about rights from that community perspective is to my mind the real next step of rights retention because yes we can talk about again the mechanism can move on for book chapters that's an obvious sort of next step but really what's the, what's the fundamental leap forward and it's moving from individual, institutional to actually really thinking about collective ownership of, of intellectual property. And I think that's that's I think Caroline's brilliant with how she just phrased that. So straight away going, you know, can, can we just record you and play it to all our academics? Because that was brilliant. Thank you. It is being recorded. I'll, I'll cut out that segment for you, Kate, and send it to you. Yeah, snip it for me, please. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen, any thoughts? Um, so, on the one hand, I agree, and I, you know, I, I see journals in my discipline very slowly flipping. So flipping is, you know, is happening, but it's glacial at the moment. But let's let's be optimistic about that. But the converse view I'd like to put forward is that I actually think the journal is dead. I don't really think the journal actually has much of a hold. It has had a hold in the past because we're beholden to, you know, getting the nature paper or getting the thing, right? But it's just the label, right? So I've actually talked for a long time, somewhat sort of tongue in cheek, but half seriously about sort of, and we've already got this in some ways, the sort of what I'd call the YouTube model of publishing. Anyone can stick a video up on YouTube, right? Most of them are not watched and a few of them are, you know, the niche videos people will watch. And then there's a few things that everybody's probably seen. Um, I like that sort of model of if the infrastructure is there, such that if anybody wants to publish, they can stick it on the archive or archive plus plus. Let this ecosystem grow around it, just as, you know, ecosystems around YouTube have, have grown. Um, but for me, journals are problematic because they're often uh, a vehicle for somebody to make money, either explicitly the publisher or, and I say this somewhat uh, some with sensitivities that, you know, some people run journal, editors run journals and they get, you know, 
uh, they get to support their society through that way. And in one sense, there's nothing harmful with that, but it's holding us back, I think. So I'm, I'm sort of in my phase of burn it all down and start again with something new because I just think the journal structure is inherently wrong. I don't care where a journal, uh, where a piece of work has been published. For me, as long as it's on PubMed, the sort of discipline, you know, the the bibliographic service uh, within medicine. If it's on, if it's on PubMed, I don't care where the journal was, right? And I'm, I'm beyond that. But I I agree that journals have an ecosystem and this scholarly thing, and I think that's really, particularly in the arts and humanities, I think I appreciate that that's actually something that is a very carefully curated and uh, uh, object that people care a lot about whereas in the sciences i just think just get rid of them and to, to be honest um but i i i've also very much in, enjoyed hearing caroline explain the you know the problems that there are about you know the ownership of these journals at large so uh, just to echo uh, kate's uh, thanks for that uh, that explanation Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, how many million hits can we get on these YouTube um, journal articles? Definitely, definitely something to think about and explore. But I'll go to Caroline because you had your hand up first. I, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to come straight back to Stephen because it's so interesting. And, and you may know this, Stephen, but when we started OLH, it was it was kind of a project and an experiment to see what we could make possible. And we took that sort of STEM public library of science plus kind of model that we would have something like plus one which which people sometimes call a mega journal or um sort of <laughs> we would call it the big bucket so we would have the big bucket and we would do away with journal titles and as you say Stephen that was kind of the radical position that we don't we want to break the mechanisms of prestige that are holding us back we want everybody to be able to access things more quickly and then the community decides post-publication what is really great and what isn't. Things sift to the top and sift to the bottom. But it's not really for us to decide, you know, in terms of 50 or 100 years, what might be the most important research. We don't know, but at least it's all there. We even talked about whether we should or shouldn't have peer review and the limitations of peer review. And should we have open peer review or should we have post-publication peer review? We had a whole range of committee discussions with our steering groups about this. And in the end, we had to settle on flipping journals. We still have our mega journal, Big Bucket. Um, it doesn't publish. It's not open to general submissions. When I started it, I had to manage submissions in any language, in any subject area. I had to try and find peer reviewers for all of these subject areas across the humanities. It was it was an absolute nightmare. I'm not going to lie. But it got us launched. Um, but yeah, I mean, Stephen's right. The, the arts and humanities um, scholarly communities are very different from the sciences. We don't publish on preprint servers. We don't publish preprints. There's no... There's no, there's not the same impetus, perhaps, to accelerate scientific discovery. We don't need people to see what our lab results are even before they've, you know, been um, been through the peer review process because people, other people, don't want to duplicate the same material. It, it's just different, you know. Our data are our writing. In in my subject, in literature, I don't really have any data. I have my analysis of some cultural objects and the way that I present that argument is the data. So um, in the end, we had to stick with journal um, communities. And so we thought, well, if we can't abolish them, then how do we make a safe passage for them? And how do we bring them home? I guess is the most cheesy way I can think of describing it. Thank you, Caroline. And so sort of Shelby is sort of, you know, working in the social sciences, sort of, you know, and I know she put your hand up, any sort of comments that you'd like to make? Well, but I am also in literature and I do agree that the difference is that we don't have data in the same way. And I've just done like this ethics form and it's like meant to be university wide. And so much of it just doesn't apply because it's so skewed towards STEM um, and social sciences. And then you find that um, because because the way that we do research and what we're researching and how we present that, it does make it like a different being in a way but I just wanted to share this idea of like different um methods of publication the YouTube model and I do think that personally there are other methods that I prefer to publish my work in like journal articles aren't my favorite 
method of short form publication. Um, like I've published work with the uh, um, Literary Encyclopedia, and there are websites like Eat Alone, which um, is like open access, accessible research in the classics. And um, I'm looking at developing my own one for research into the alt right. And I think that this is like um, a um, it, I found it a much more preferable way to write and be published, and it's something that I want to advance in so many other ways. So it's it's kind of like a journal in that it is academically rigorous and, you know, but there's more freedom to write how you want to write and what you want to write. And um, the you know for sure that it's your work on this, that you own your work. And I think that that's, that's a really important thing. And I think the fact that it's, a lot of them um, prioritize readability as well, which means that it's not only um, open access in terms of um, people at other institutions who can't access it, but also people are much more likely to read it who aren't in academia at all, um, which is what we want, right? We want to make an impact beyond just the other people in academia. So I think that this, it does open up a lot more doors. And I do think that this is personally what I, I prefer in terms of short form publications now and especially now that I'm sort of sat here and I'm like oh my god do I own my journal articles I have no idea um so yeah <laughs> thank you Shelby that's really interesting because yeah obviously the title of this was sort of about short form publications but we have very much focused on sort of you know journal articles and sort of the processes around that so perhaps going forward next year open access week something around other sort of um short form publications maybe sort of a really kind of um good sort of topic a good way forwards just going to quickly check where well, i don't think we've had anything come through on the q a or the chat and just conscious of the time i know that this is sort of a um perhaps a, a really big question um for sort of um well holly did you want to sort of mention did you have a question there are a couple of questions in there but they're both from oh, me well, and hannah <laughs> sorry they're they're both from me and hannah okay <laughs> sorry I are they, they're not they don't seem to be coming through on oh, okay. my team so holly do you want to kind of go go ahead and yeah, ask those you, questions yeah thank you there's one from hannah Krogo. i don't know if hannah wants to ask herself if she's still here she might have left um so hannah's the open research librarian at the university of essex who's um oh she hasn't got a microphone she's um helped support this um, week come to be um so thank you hannah for your help and support um but her question is um, and I suppose it's to everybody on the panel, if you could change one thing about the current publishing landscape for short form publications, what would it be? I suppose we've just answered that kind of sort of some of the things we've been talking about, but we could open that up a little bit more potentially if people want to comment. I can see Stephen's got a big smile on his face. Maybe he wants to go first. <laughs> well, on the one hand, I think the last 20, 20 30, 40 years have been an existence proof of if you change just one thing, then we think we're better off and actually it hasn't really worked. So slightly cynically and jaded, I think just changing one thing isn't going to be transformational unless it's one of these nuclear options like burn it all down and, and do that. But with that aside, I think the one thing that I would like to see to improve this is transparency transparency over, in particular, it comes down to money, transparency over where this ecosystem is supported. There is a ton of money in this. If there wasn't, publishers wouldn't be here, right? So there's a ton of money in it. And it's like pulling teeth. I've tried and, you know, we've been lucky people like Tim Gowers here at Cambridge started the FOIs a few years ago about the, the costs of big deals. It's like pulling teeth and just an exercise in just how how much staying power you've got to try and understand the, the the money transfer. If this were transparent and it was clear, you go to any journal and you can see how much money the journal gets from the from the publisher and how much uh, costs there are and stipends to all the editorial board. If that was all transparent, I would personally think we were one step forward. But I'm very conscious that things may then change. Anyway, that's my one thing. 
Thank you, Stephen. Um, funnily enough, I've been doing a bit of research around transparency, um, particularly in relation to um, BPCs and open access books and long form output types. Um, and, you know, as you say, it's incredibly opaque. And when you ask a publisher for more information, it's like, well, you know, it depends on the length and it depends on the type and it depends on the disciplinary. You know, it's so, so hard to get an answer, isn't it? But maybe we should open it up a little bit more to the others. Kate, did you want to? Um, I was actually going to go, I, I entirely agree with Stephen that there is a little bit of going changing one thing. Yeah, what's the point? Um, but what I would like to be changed <laughs> at that very small level is the the licensing options that journals offer so there are some journals that i shan't name because we're being recorded who seem to deliberately order creative commons licenses in a way that you are led towards choosing the most restrictive license now that might be fine because that might be what you want but if you if you're not well up on what you have to do make the default the one that is the default for you know, the, the funder, if you say I'm funded by X, great, that should be able to then go, well, guess what, this is your license. Um, so at that very, very small level, <laughs> I would like um, better, better displays of Creative Commons licenses that don't lead people to choosing ones they didn't really mean, they didn't want, their funder doesn't um, want them to use, that then we have to spend substantial amounts of time trying to get resolved. And of course, rights retention is great because what we can do is go, hey, accepted manuscript, CC by, we don't really care what you put on your published version. Um, but it's not ideal. It's not ideal. You know, it, it feels quite duplicitous with some publishers that they are deliberately trying to do this. Shelby? Um, I suppose one thing that I would want to change related to open access and that I sort of alluded to uh, is accessibility in terms of language like I think we should really normalize um, the way that we write being much more accessible because I find that some people mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a certain culture of okay it's open access but I've written it in such a way that um, only if you've got 10,000 degrees will you understand it I've peppered in loads of French because of course everyone understands French and oh what do you mean you didn't do Latin at school I've put in loads of Latin and I say this as someone who um, has one foot in classics as well but has no ancient languages like I think that there are a lot of things that we can do even in terms of authorship that will help with accessibility and I think that it goes hand in hand with open access because I think there's very little um point making your article open access if um, there are like four languages in there and nothing's translated and um, you make all these like clever allusions to things that only you've read and it's like a weird maze to get to your point um, that it's it's almost like a challenge like you have to be this educated to to read and I think that that's something that goes hand in hand with open access is accessibility what's the point in it being open access if it's not accessible um, yeah and potentially cannot be used by people who are just you know potentially entering an academic field or yeah people sort of who want to who want to take what you have done and sort of perhaps translate it into another field as well so really good point thank you Shelby just very conscious of the time yeah. Caroline one thing that you would change yeah, so I the first journal I set up was a short form journal. It was about two thousand words, three three thousand words. Like Shelby, I wanted uh, a much more lively online kind of form of research engagement. I wanted AV in there, you know, music clips, film clips, um, hyperlinks, social media buttons. That's how. That's kind of how I got into open access by setting up that journal. And the thing that I struggled with the most was prestige that um, early career researchers were sharing, you know, cutting edge, really exciting developments in their field. It was very rapid publication. We didn't do peer review. We used comments and annotation as a kind of post-publication review, um, but it wasn't referable and it, it didn't help people get jobs. You know, they couldn't put it on their CV. And I mean, they did put it on their CV, but it certainly wasn't going to help them get hired anywhere. So that was incredibly frustrating. They still had to then go and publish the traditional journal with the legacy publisher. So if if there's a way we could 
continue tackling academic prestige and author behaviour, the way that authors choose the less progressive publisher. But they do that because, you know, their tenure committees and their hiring committees are still choosing the less progressive publication formats when they're shortlisting candidates. So it is a systemic problem, but I am hopeful that things can change. Thank you very much. And really good to kind of hear that really sort of broad range of perspectives. Yeah, just um, can see some people having to drop out now. We have had a question from Jonathan in um, the um, chat. So I don't know if it's possible for panellists just to sort of just jot down a few thoughts that we could, um, you know, either respond to Jonathan directly or just drop a few thoughts that we can then um, sort of send when we send out um, the recording in relation to Jonathan's question, the one from Holly um, as well around uh, rights retention and author choice, if that would be okay. Yeah, oh wonderful, thank you very much. So I think all that remains for me to say is thank you very much again to all our panellists for your time, for your insight and for your sort of um, comments and advice guidance this morning. It's been such a wide ranging discussion, which I think just does demonstrate sort of, you know, that we're, we're not there yet, that there is still a long way to go. But I think sort of working together with discussions like this, um, it is something that we can, you know, perhaps move that pace from glacial to, I don't know what the next one, <laughs> next fastest is, but sort of move that pace slightly and move the move the field slightly. So all that remains for me to say is say thank you very much again to the panellists. A recording will be sent out and thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.